Hi everyone. Now I thought I'd do another responding to your comments video. We've been getting quite a lot of uh, discussion and debate going on in the comments down below. Also getting emails through on YouTube at republic.org.uk. So join the debate, get in the comment section or send us an email to that address. Don't forget also, if you go to republic.org.uk, you can find out more about Republic and about the issues, as well as how to join or donate and support the campaign. And one quick request, do make sure you subscribe to the channel and share the content, get other people joining in, getting involved in the conversation. So the first comment I want to respond to is this Matt Mosley from uh, a couple of weeks ago now, I think. He says, uh, write a proposed constitution, put it on the website, have people vote on what they agree with and make it possible to add things, then petition parliament for it to be debated. I think that, I mean, the petition parliament thing I've talked about in a previous comments video, it's a good idea. We're going to be doing it uh, very shortly as soon as the Parliament, <laughs> Parliamentary Commission's uh, Petitions uh, Committee get on with publishing it um, on royal funding. The writing a proposed constitution online that people can then engage with is a good idea. Um, I think that's something which we've thought about before, haven't got around to doing it. You and David Jones said, uh, do not forget or ignore that a reformed UK parliamentary model must also accommodate better and fully equitable de uh, devolution to the constituent nations. Only a federal model will satisfy this necessity. With the potential for a fully repurposed democratic second chamber, a way forward is offered. Otherwise, Scotland and Wales would not be complacent or compliant with a con continuation of an unequal union. I mean, there's a lot of issues here. We don't get into uh, too much detail about the de uh, devolution. We think that, and particularly nationalism and independence for uh, Scotland, for example, we tend to think that those are separate issues which can be accommodated more easily in a republic, I think. There is obviously a big question with the Im huge imbalance between the size of England and its population, which makes up about 85% of the UK's population and uh, its other constituent nations. And of course, England um, doesn't have its own parliament. So there are a lot of complicated issues there, but it's, it's not necessarily an area that we spend a lot of time on. But I think that if we do spend time as a country looking at uh, a new constitution, then these things can be resolved. And you know, other countries do resolve these sorts of issues. Uh, by writing it down. So Anton, welcome to the cause. You have converted me, Anton says. You should have a merch shop so people can at least buy car window stickers, house window stickers, maybe a nice mug. Yeah, uh, we're going to do that. It's just a few practical issues that we need to resolve first. Um, it's probably going to be the new year before we relaunch the shop, which we did used to have on our website. So watch this space and we'll make sure that we um, tell you all about it on here as well as through our emails and make sure you do subscribe to our emails on republic.org.uk so you get all the latest updates and information. So replying to the video nonsense of the British Constitution, Kevin Hesketh said uh, the Human Rights Act should be our constitution. Uh, it should be on every schoolroom wall and on every police station office wall along with on the walls of number 10 Downing Street. The monarchy is exempt from the Human Rights Act and other laws. How can a member of the House of Lords Call themselves democratic, and why would you stay there or accept a seat if you if uh, seat there if you are a democrat? I think we all know why. I think there's an important point here. I mean, I do think that the Human Rights Act is a um, is an important factor in our constitution. It can't be the only part of the constitution because I think that needs to explain um, that document needs to explain what the institutions are, how people are appointed and elected, and so on. But I think there's an important point that Kevin is making and also with the House of Lords I do think you know it's difficult to really accept that someone is taking a seat in the House of Lords if they believe that the House of Lords is wrong is undemocratic and so on so the House of Lords is a whole other thing and I'm going to do another video on that uh, very soon so watch this space. So then Joe Dominican makes a really interesting point which I have sort of made a few times myself which um, well similar point anyway I don't think any acts of Parliament before 1928 when we became a democracy, uh, women got the vote, most men got the vote only in 1918, should be allowed to stand since they are not democratic laws. This will leave a huge hole in how our system operates. So yes, we need Parliament to endorse a democratic constitution with the checks and balances that we expect. I mean, uh, whether it's practical or not, I don't know, but it certainly is a point of principle. I mean, it's hard to argue that Britain has been a democracy for more than 100 years, given that the vast majority of people were simply excluded from the whole process. They weren't allowed to vote, they weren't allowed to sit in Parliament until about a hundred years ago. And as Joe points out, most men were excluded from voting in the democratic process until the early part of the uh, 20th century. 
and all women were excluded up until the 1920s. Graham, would you want your head, elected head of state to have fancy events and outfits like the Queen or be humble like in Germany? Now, I am a big fan of humility in public office. I don't think that you know the pomposity that you find uh, with the monarchy, but also with um, elements of the, <laughs> the French presidency, I just think it's a little bit off. I think that you know the principle of democracy is that we're all equals and we then employ people to run the country as it were on a day-to-day -day basis in government to make laws in parliament and they are there to work for us and we use elections to choose who those people are going to be so you know the the idea that you then aggrandize them and put them on this pedestal and give them fancy robes or whatever it is and fancy titles i like the idea in america that they early on said we're going to we're not going to give lots of fancy titles to the president it's going to be president and it's going to be mr president and that's it you know you're not going to be called right honorable or her majesty his majesty whatever we have someone called um matanza mafia fedora um i don't know why but uh he said i'm assuming it's a he sorry uh glad you said this stuff graham have you ever read tony ben's commonwealth of britain bill it's a worthy option to consider i have read it a long time ago i think tony ben introduced it to parliament somewhere sometime around 1990 1991 uh, maybe a, bit, a little bit later obviously it didn't get anywhere it was a private members bill and it was never going to um, get very far but it's an interesting read i don't agree with everything that tony ben put in it but i think what i might do is another video of where i look at some of the proposals for the new constitution that are around it's not the only one the tony ben one there are some others that have been written uh, over the last 20 uh, 25 years. So then Ober asked, who do you think has the loyalty of the British military, Parliament or the Queen? Well, to be perfectly honest, I think it is uh, Parliament or more to the point government. Um, the government has direct control over the armed forces. I don't think that um, the armed forces in this country would take up arms in defence of the monarchy against the democratic will. So I don't really think that's a big uh, problem. I, I do think that the oath of allegiance for the armed forces in this country is ridiculous. You know, it really ought to be only an allegiance to the country and a pledge to defend democracy uh, and uh, and really a loyalty to the people not to the institutions of government so i do think that should be changed and changed pretty soon um, lots of comments to the stephen fry video too many to say here a lot of them are just sort of and, and thank you for this just saying you know good comments good takedown and so on um, i think a lot of people like stephen as an actor comedian and so on and agree with him on a lot of that, a lot of other things and we're perhaps surprised to find out that he's a monarchist and like me disappointed about, <laughs> about the strength of his argument someone called signal detection uh wrote a comment love stephen fry but anyone who thinks the royal family in norway works needs to google princess marta louise a clairvoyant whose boyfriend is a shaman and who runs classes in talking to the dead um fair enough i i don't know about princess Martha Louise, but yeah, Google it and let's see if that's true. And one of the things Stephen Fry was saying, which I've also picked up elsewhere, is this idea of if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And uh, Shadow Web EB um, came on and made the comment 150 years ago. Why do you want to replace our horses with cars? It works. It's not broken. Don't replace things that just work. And I think this is um, <laughs> quite a neat way of applying to this daft argument. You know there are better things that we can do even if the thing we have at the moment or the way we're doing it at the moment works in your opinion so there's no reason why we can't replace something even if you think it's working and then jack mack what are your thoughts on the house of lords we don't vote these people into the positions and i read its membership is granted by appointment guessing the royals again so yeah the majority there's something like what is it 900 i think or 850 lords now it's a huge bloated ridiculous uh, institution but on top of those appointees who are mainly, by the way, not experts in their field, they're mainly former MPs, um, people that tried to become MPs and uh, didn't succeed. Uh, party donors are in there. Um, so, you know, it's not an edifying list of appointees. Um, and then you have 92 people who are hereditary peers. And then you have 26 peers who are there because they are senior bishops in the Church of England, which is as ridiculous as the the rest of it if not more so so yeah i'm going to do a whole video on that so we'll go through it and and look at how ridiculous the, the house of lords is and why it should go and finally someone called uh, withered guji don't know what that means i hope it's not rude um not sure what republicans are worried about the monarchy will obviously disintegrate after liz anyway 
There is absolutely no one of her calibre or command's respect, like she does, to carry on. But be be careful what you wish for, President Blair, anybody. Now, two things here. When I first got involved in republicanism about 15 years ago, a lot of people would say, oh, well, you know, it's just going to fade away. You know, it's just going to, don't worry about it. There's no need to sort of campaign on it. It will just fade away. Now, I've never worked out how that's supposed to happen. You know, institutions don't, <laughs> don't fade away. This doesn't happen. You need to actually abolish it. It needs a law change. It needs a constitution change. And in terms of the, the caliber of whoever takes over, it doesn't work like that. It's not based on the caliber of who becomes head of state. It is going to be Charles, and after him, William, and after him, George, which probably, given George's age, takes us up to the end of the century at least. So, no, it's not, uh, unfortunately, going to um, disintegrate or fade away. It is stuck there until we dislodge it and get rid of it. And President Blair, well, I've only met one person who wants President Blair, and it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't Tony Blair. Um, you know, he's not going to win an election. I very much doubt he's ever going to want to stand for an election. Former prime ministers are former for a reason. You know, they've they lost support from, from the public. So, you know, it's unlikely that they're going to stand. And it's not, I don't think, the experience of places like Ireland and Germany. What I would say, though, is if Tony Blair did stand and we voted for him, then he should obviously be president because we have decided that actually, well, we do want him. So that's it from me for now. I'm going to do another video responding to your comments fairly soon because I'm quite keen to, to get into this debate and to answer one, some of the things you say. So keep getting in the comments, get the debate, uh, keep the debate going. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel, to share the videos, to get over to republic.org.uk and find out how you can support the campaign. We rely entirely on thousands of people around the country who give us small donations and membership fees we don't get large, huge grants and uh, massive donations and so on. Uh, so please do get over there and support us so we can carry on doing this work. So check it all out on republic.org.uk. Links also there to our social media. And I'll see you next time.